Hey, good morning, everyone. And we're holding over here in Tehillim Samech Tes, which is 69. And we began last week to describe a very beautiful mushal uh, parable that David Melech is speaking about. And that is that Klal Yisrael is compared to Shoshanim, or compared to roses. And we know that roses can only grow if there are thorns that are all around the stems, which are protecting the rose, the petal, the flower, from all of the enemies of the rose. The rose is such a beautiful flower in the eyes of the, the bug kingdom and, the, and the, the animal kingdom that it's looking to get the rose. And therefore Hashem made, not by mistake, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made purposely that there should be thorns all around the stem. And therefore whatever enemies of the rose will want to come and attack the rose, they will end up getting poked and they'll stay away. Only after it's plucked out of the ground and we want to put it on our Shabbos table or your husbands would like to give it to you for your anniversary, those 12 beautiful long stem roses, only then do we take the thorns off to show how beautiful it is. And we said the mushal is the following. Klal Yisrael is the Shoshana, we are the rose. And we are the most beautiful nation that there is in the world. And there are many people that want to come and they would like to damage us and hurt us and take us away from our treasured nation status that we are on. And they would like to undermine what it means for Klal Yisrael to be this very precious and this holy nation. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes thorns. And the thorns, as we pointed out through the words of Tehillim, are really all of those struggles and the trials and the difficulties and the pain and the nisyonis, the challenges that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends to Klal Yisrael, that is what surrounds us and allows us to grow in beco- and become that beautiful nation that we are going to become. Meaning, we think that sometimes in our life the difficulties are the problems of our life, and we are realizing right now that it's not that there are problems, they are our greatest friends, they are the protection of Am Yisrael, it's what keeps us growing and, and rising up to higher levels in our existence, and therefore the thorns of our life, the, the pointy, sharp parts that hurt sometimes, that exactly is what allows us to continue growing and be protected from the enemies of Klal Yisrael. Eventually, after 120 years, a person will be plucked from this world. At that time, HaKadosh Baruch will take off all the thorns that were there, and we're going to be the most beautiful, radiant rose that you could imagine. But in this world, it doesn't work like that. In this world, we must go through the Nisyonis, through these challenges, but that itself is what is allowing us and helping us to grow and become the people and the nation that we so desire to become. So I'm holding over here in the fifth, uh, in the sixth verse, and the the pasuk says like this in no, number vav, letter vav, Elohim, God, Ata Yedatam Ivalti. You know my foolishness, v'ashmoisai, my sinfulness, mimchalo nechachadu, nothing is hidden from you. Klal Yisrael is talking to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And we're trying to put into perspective, why are we such a beleaguered nation? Why are we so always traveling in Gullus in exile? Why are we always at bay of the, at the enemies of the Jewish people? Why is there so much suffering amongst Klal Yisrael. As we pointed out last week and many times, you'll never find another nation in history that has had to go through as much as Klal Yisrael has. No other nation has been from every continent in the world, and they go and they become successful, and then they get destroyed, and then they get beaten, and then they get, ex- and they get exterminated. No other nation has gone through what we go through. No other nation, little tiny country called Eretz Israel, could be in the news every single day and make people go crazy in all of America and all over the world. There's no other nation that's, that's like us. So why do we have to go through all of this? And if we under, begin to understand the reasons why it is that we have to go through things that no other arm, um, no other nation will ever go through, and that really at the end of the day it's for our best interest that HaKadosh Baruch Hu places us in the 
challenging times of our nation, so then perhaps we'll have a better outlook on when things are not quote unquote going our way. Says David Amelech, I know, or you know, Akadosh Baruch Hu, the foolish things that I do, and the Ashmai Saimim Chalo Nichado, I'm not hiding anything from you. Says the says Rev Hirsch, Klal Yisrael does not never intends to whitewash its deeds, its mis- misdemeanors, and the sins from Hakadosh Baruch Hu. because if indeed we had behaved like angels, so then we wouldn't be in Gullus right now. This is a very simple fact. We spoke about this a thousand times over the years. The whole world, especially between Klal Yisrael and Hakadosh Baruch Hu, it lives and exists mida keneged mida, measure for measure. That means the way that we act towards Hashem, that is the way He's going to act towards us. When we are doing what Klal Yisrael is supposed to be doing, when we are behaving as a nation, not just as individuals, as a nation, when we are living a life that is quality in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when the land of Eretz Yisrael is being run according to what the Torah says, that's the only schus that we have to that land, is because the Torah says Hashem is giving the land to Avram and his son Yitzchak and Klal Yisrael. That's it. That's why we have a schus to the land. So when we're living in the right way and we're progressing as a nation in the right direction, so the everything should be, at that point, everything should be good for Klal Yisrael. If we find ourselves in Gullus, if we find our nation going through difficult times, if Klal Yisrael is torn asunder and being sent out and shipped off to all different places in the universe, and there's nations that are rising up against us, and there's wild and, and vicious anti-Semitism in the world, and the Jewish people are going out to battle at the war, and we're losing beautiful young men every single day, Rachman al-Islam. So then, says David HaMelech, if we would be angels, none of this would be happening. HaKadosh Baruch would raise us up to the highest of levels, everybody would bow down to the Jewish people and say, we want to be like you. Like when it was when they were leaving Mitzrayim. When they were leaving Egypt, as we're getting now into the beginning of the Parsha, Shmais, we're just beginning to get into the Shibud, into the bondage and the slavery, and the harsh treatment that we receive. But once that all the Makais, the plagues are over, and Klal Yisrael is being redeemed, everybody wanted to be on board with Klal Yisrael. Because they realized that there's nobody as special as the Jewish people. We were people of Amuna. We were serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We're chasing after him into the wilderness. We have no idea where we're going. Eventually we come to Arsina. We receive the Torah. We're so precious. What other nation in the world would do such a thing? Everybody wanted a peace. And that's why we have this nation called the Eruv Rav, which was the mixed multitudes of non-Jewish people that said, we also want to be Jewish. We also want a piece of them. And they were insincere, and they've caused us problems until this very day, but that's for another time. Says Rav Hirsch, we're not going to deny the fact, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that if you're punishing us, and you send us into exile, and we are in Gullahs 2,000 years already, and there's a base of Migdash that's lying in ruins, and there's a big mosque that's sitting on top, and there's terrorists, and there's bombings, and there's car rammings into, into, into army posts, and there's soldiers that are out there that are getting killed, and the nations of the world are against us, and the UN is calling us the worst, the worst genocidal nation in, in the history of the world. So then we can't hide from the fact that we are a very imperfect nation. We're not going to sit and claim we are so holy, we are so perfect, even those of us that are coming, we daven every single day, and we do the mitzvahs, and we work, we work on guarding ourselves from Hashanah. Our, no one's going to say, I'm, a, I'm an angel. And if we're not angels, those of us that are within the walls of the Beis HaMidrash, so then certainly the 80% of the assimilated Jews that are outside the walls of the shul and the yeshiva certainly are far from the perfection of, of being malachim, of being angels. That means that the majority of Klal Yisrael is in the not angel status. And therefore, we're not going to try to pretend we're innocent, we did nothing wrong, everything is, doesn't make any sense. Of course, that when we end up getting uh, innocent, when we get uh, 
charged, he says, falsely charged by the nations, when we end up getting punishments and all these things, there's nothing false that's going on in the world. It's all midah k'nege midah. And we discussed this many times. I don't want to go into all the details of anti-Semitism, just to harp upon it again. But as we're going to learn in this up-and-coming parsha, parsha Shmois, which is really the roots of all of anti-Semitism, it, there is no coincidence. It doesn't just happen the, the Goyish world starts hating Klal Yisrael. They just decide, we're going to hate the Jewish people and we're going to make their lives miserable. It is me the connected me the more that we align with them and try to become like them and live their lives and get in their face and do their things, the more there is a backlash, the more they don't want to see us anymore and it comes into the world. So if there's so much anti-Semitism in the world, and there's so much war that's going on, and battles, and loss of life, and difficulties, and fear, and anxiety, all that which is permeating the, the world right now, especially on Klal Yisrael, we have to understand, as David Amalek says, we're not denying the fact, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We're not perfect. We're far from being angels. The Jewish people are not behaving in the way that they're supposed to, again, we don't know why HaKadosh Baruch Hu did what he did on October 7th. We don't know. And we will never know until Mashiach will come and he will enlighten us why it is tragically 1,400 people had to be killed within six hours of life. We don't know. We have no idea. There are those that would like to say that they know and so they give reasons. Now, one of the reasons that they would like to give, although it's very hard to understand why Hashem would slaughter 1,400 Jews, but there was so much fighting that was going on in Eretz Yisrael amongst Klal Yisrael. So much hatred, so much sinas chinam, so much overbearing consternation that the people had for each other. So there are those that would like to say because that we were so divided and so far apart, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought such a massacre upon Klal Yisrael. We're not Nevi'im, we're not prophets. We cannot say such statements. It's not fair to say such a statement. How do you tell a mother of one of those children that was at the, the music festival, you know why your son was killed? First of all, he was driving on, on Simcha Saira, and he was dancing around on Simcha Saira because the Jews in the Tel Aviv were beating each other up on, on, uh, on what do you call it, on Yom Kippur, that's why your son got s- slaughtered. can't say such a thing. We're not Nevi'im, we're not prophets, we don't know. But we do know that Klal Yisrael is not Malachim. And when we're not angelic in the way that we behave and the way that we do our mission in this world, so then we open ourselves up to the wrath of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We open ourselves up to having to be disciplined to get consequences. What exactly are all the things that we did wrong? There's a long laundry list of the things that Klal Yisrael is doing wrong right now at this time. Maybe through the battles and maybe through the desperate times that we find ourselves in where we realize that we have to band together and we have to improve, we have to become better. Maybe through all of that, so we're we're in Masak and we're fixing up some of our less angelic behaviors and qualities. But at the end of the day, says David HaMelech, we're not going to hide from you, Hashem. We're not going to say we don't deserve this. Whatever you send away, there is a reason why you're sending it. It is me the connected me the whether we will know for sure what we did wrong or we will not know. That is not the point. The point is is that we know that we all have what to improve upon and make ourselves better. And therefore, he writes, Hashem knows very well where Klal Yisrael made mistakes. Again, we might not be aware of everything that we do, but our Kodesh Baruch who knows. And our failings consist of, above all, of the iniquities in the relationship that we have with Hashem. Kodesh Baruch knows everything we've done wrong. We cheated on our taxes, and we spoke Lashon Hara, and we weren't so careful with Shabbos, and we went this, and all the different things. But what's suffering the most? What's suffering the most is the relationship that we have with our Kodesh Baruch Hu. Who could say with with true conviction and confidence that we are the best in our relationship with Hashem? Who can say that when we we daven, it's always with the greatest amount of kavanah, when we make decisions in our life, it's always taking Hashem into account. We always always think 
like seven steps ahead of ourselves before we do anything to make sure our Kodesh Baruch is going to be happy with the thing that we're doing. How do we know that all the little details and everything like that in our lives are what our Kodesh Baruch really wants? How do we know such a thing? And therefore, David HaMelech is saying, our Baruch, and this is David HaMelech. David HaMelech was a man that was in constant check of himself, always watching over, trying to make himself better as an Oyvind Hashem, as a servant. And David is saying that we are well aware, Hashem, the relationship that we have with you is severed and it's weak and it's not as strong as it possibly could be. And because of that, we are in Golis. We are in exile. Ah, Yaakovich Baruch, you want us to get closer to you? So why do you send us farther away? Doesn't make any sense. You have a husband and a wife that they are not getting along. Shalom Bayez is miserable between the two of them. So what does the husband do? He tells his wife, get out of town. That's going to make things better. What do they call it? Like a planned separation? Is that the better way to do it? No, that's not the better way to do it. The better way to do it is, let's get together, let's talk about our issues, let's get some help, let's get some advice from someone outside of our struggles, internal struggles in our marriage, and let's work it out and let's bridge the gap in the brokenness of our relationship. So HaKadosh Baruch certainly knows what is best for Kal Yisrael. So now we're suffering and struggling in our relationship. Davening, not as good as it could be. Learning, nowhere near where it should be. Shmiras Halashen, very, very lax. Atzniyas, brachas, all the different things. Yira Shemayim, fear of heaven, amunah bitachin. We're struggling in all the areas. So our relationship is very, very choppy. So Hashem says, okay, you know what you deserve? I'm going to send you out of your land. I'm going to turn the goyim against you. You're going to be miserable. That's the kind of way that we're going to rebuild our relationship. But this is tough love. HaKadosh Baruch is the tough love to make things miserable. But that's the answer that we're saying. That it sometimes takes, HaKadosh Baruch has to shake us up. And he has to make us realize who we really are and what we really are and where we have, where we have strayed to. And that now we have to work so much harder to come back to Hashem. And when you work, and you work, and you work, and you work, and you put in the energy and the effort to come back to the Rebbein Yishayim, so then you will achieve levels that were much greater and much higher and much stronger and much more secure than they were before the battle begun. Before you were sent into Golis, before HaKadosh Baruch was severing the ties between us and him, because we did it on our own. When you have to prove yourself, when you have to show, it's like the, like the husband that really made many mistakes in his marriage, and he now has to prove himself to his wife how much he loves her, that he cares about her, that he thinks about her, that he's there for her. This guy has to go way overboard right now to show that he's sincere. And eventually, after maybe 20 years of doing that, he'll prove to his wife that he means it. The ladies are not even la- they're not even laughing. He's lucky if she, if she will accept it. And that's what we have to work on. HaKadosh Baruch he sent us into Gullis. He brought tragedies on Klal Yisrael. He's put us in very dark times right now. For one reason. Because he cherishes the relationship that he has with us. And he wants us to cherish that relationship as well. And if we will in fact begin to cherish what we have. And we will start working harder and harder and harder to get there. So then HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to take away the bonds and the chains of Gullis, of the exile. He's going to bring us back close as ever. He's going to give us back our land in the way that it's supposed to be. Mashiach will come, the base of the will be built, and things will work out exactly as HaKadosh Baruch Hu has prescribed in his Torah and in Chazal is the way that they describe things. But, in the meantime, we have to be honest with HaKadosh Baruch Hu and honest with ourselves and admit that we are at fault. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, to admit that we are at fault. You know, when you counsel couples that are struggling in Shalom Bayez, usually each one has tightness, they have complaints against the other person, and they want so badly for the other person to admit that what they're complaining about is true. 
And each one just wants the other one to admit that what I claim against you is true and you're making a big mistake. And they just sit there and stale me. She's screaming and yelling and complaining. He does this, he does da 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 And he says, well, that's because you do da 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 this. And then they're sitting there. Okay, so is anyone going to own up to what they do? No. No, it's her fault. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's his fault. Says HaKadosh Baruch we cannot point the fingers at anybody else. We can't point it at the UN. We cannot point it at the people on the streets. We can't point it at the, the crazy leftists and all. We can't point it anywhere else. Can't even point it at Hamas. The only place that we can point our finger is at ourselves. Because HaKadosh Baruch doesn't want destruction in the world. He doesn't want to slaughter young men in war. He doesn't want the economy of Eretz Yisrael to be collapsing right now because most of the stores are no longer open and people are, don't have jobs, they don't have homes, and they're living in hotels. He doesn't want that. So if there is these things that are going on, says David HaMelech, then we must point at ourselves. And that is, we're not going to try to hide anything, Hashem. If there is a gullus that is going on, it's our fault. That's the first step. The first step is that it's our fault. If we would have been angelic, we would have been malachim, angels, none of this would have happened. But we're not. Which area? Somewhere in our relation with HaKadosh Baruch Hu is creating a problem that, is, that Hashem is bringing this into the world. And therefore he goes on to write that um, he writes the following that the, the sinfulness, the foolish sins of Klal Yisrael, that really was part of the character of the Jewish people, which now has not found a lot of favor in the eyes of Hashem, that is what the consequence is that we forfeited the freedom that we had as a nation that was with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, living in Eretz Yisrael, so on and so forth. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu then scattered us amongst the nations of the world. Now, but listen to what, the, what, the, what Rav Hirsch writes, and we'll see the other Mephoshim understand in the same way. One of the reasons that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends us in the Gullis, although that it's very good for us, because it's going to cleanse us of our sins, hopefully will make us return our attention to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but at the same time, Klal Yisrael becomes a fitting instrument to bear Hashem's message to all of sinful, erring mankind, which had to be brought back to Hashem. Meaning, everybody knows Klal Yisrael is the treasure nation. Everybody knows that. Even the Goyim have the, they have the Old Testament. So they know there's an Old Testament. Even the, even the whoever's out in the world knows the Jewish people is what the Bible talks about. You believe in the Bible, you don't believe it, but everybody knows the Bible talks about Klal Yisrael. So everybody knows that we're special. Everyone knows that we're unique. So then why are we in Gullis? Why is our country at war? Why are there murders being taken place? Why is our economy crumb? Why is all this happening? So Klaus says, you know why it's happening? Because of us. Because we're imperfect. And we're faulting. And we're stumbling. And we are falling. And we're not doing the right things. And as a result of that, we are buckling down and we are becoming better people, doing tshuva, embracing our Kodesh Baruch, embracing his Torah, his mitzvahs, Avas Yisrael, all the things that we see going on in our eyes right now, we're doing all of that. And then everybody begins to realize, oh, if Klal Yisrael, who is so lofty and so chashiv and so great, if they are getting punished because they went away from our Kodesh Baruch that means Hashem doesn't like it when people do the wrong thing. So that means that all the nations that we come in contact with as a result of our gullis, of our exiles, they are supposed to learn that lesson as well. Look at the Jewish people and realize why they ended up in Spain and Rome and in South America and America. Realize why they ended up. Why would the Jewish people that HaKadosh Baruch Hu promised the land of Israel to why would they be living in Tarzana, California? It doesn't make any sense. Must be because they misbehaved. Well, if you misbehave in Nazareth Hashem, He's going to punish you. So it's supposed to make a, even the non-Jew begin to think to themselves, maybe I better be careful. Maybe I better improve myself. Maybe I better elevate myself to become a better person so that the master of the universe that's punishing the Jewish people is not going to punish me and my nation as well. 
And therefore we have a, a way to be the or legoyim, the light to the, Jew, to the world, even while we're being punished in Gullus. And he says that's part of what Gullus is all about. Part of Gullus is to reveal to the world the way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu deals with human beings. And that is Mida Keneged, Mida Measure for Measure. We have to behave ourselves the best that we possibly can. So this is how this is how David Amel starts off over here this idea. The next the next verse number seven, Al Yevayshu vi Kaivecha, let those who hope. Let them not be disappointed through me. This is David Amelech is saying, Hashem Elokim Tzvokais, Hashem Masterful God of Hosts, Al Yikamu Bi Mevakshecha Eloke Yisrael. Those that are, those that are seeking you, Hakadosh Baruch Hu, they should not blush through me, which means they should not be embarrassed. So Rav Hirsch points out over here that you have Kaivecha. Um, and you have those that are hoping for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and you have those that are seeking HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, what is it coming to teach us over here? And he says like this, Kaivecha, those that hope for Hashem, are the ones that are striving towards Hashem with all of their being, and, ho- and we, who hope to find Hashem. The hoping, the waiting, the hoping, that I'm, I'm hoping to you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the best that I can do, I want to find you. Mivak Shecha are those who search for the manifestation of Hashem's hand in their present lives and in the course of their fate. So Kivech is like, I'm hoping for the future when I'm going to find Hashem, when He's going to come and rescue me from whatever trials and whatever difficulties I'm in. Mevach Shecha, a Mevakesh is someone right now in my life, I'm looking for the manifestation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now people ask me all the time, what kind of a shul do you have? So what, it's like young Israel, it's like Bali Tshuva, the Frum, like what kind of people do you have going to your shul? I say, I have Mevach Hashem. Mevach Hashem are those that are seeking HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't matter whether you wear a hat or you wear a white yarmulke or whether you're not yet from, it doesn't matter. There's one common denominator, mevak she'ashem. People that are trying to find HaKadosh Baruch and grow in their life. And that's what he's saying over here. A mevakesh, someone who has a bikush, a desire, is someone who is looking to find the manifestation of HaKadosh Baruch in their lives right now. Kaivecha means, I know right now it's difficult, I'm hoping for the future. Mavakesh is right now, HaKadosh Baruch reveal yourself to me. Let me find where you are. Even in the Gullus, HaKadosh Baruch is there. Even in difficulties. I said over a story yesterday in Shul about a, a, a nace that took place. I think most of you were not here. Maybe some were here, but some were not here yesterday. So I'll tell, what? Okay. One was, but again, it's your Chazara. We'll review the story because it's such an, you were here? Oh, I didn't say okay. Okay, so for Rosanna, we're going to tell the story again. Okay? And as I pointed out, this story is a first-hand story from the mother of the soldier that it happened to. And the point is, I want to tell you what happened after I told over the story. And that is that there was a, there's a, there's a soldier in the IDF, call him Ellie. He grew up in a very illustrious Torah family. He went off the derech, unfortunately. He left the pathways of Yiddishkeit. And he's fighting in Gaza right now. And they had a, a, a long, long, hard day and night fighting the battles. And Baruch Hashem, I think their platoon was all safe and everybody was well. But at nighttime, they came to like a, a, an abandoned house in Gaza. They wanted a place to be able just to lay down and sleep. It was a very long day. They clear out the house. Baruch Hashem, no terrorists, nobody's around. They go inside of this house. And... There's an upstairs and a downstairs. Nine men are downstairs, and the rest of the guys go upstairs. It's late. They're tired. They're exhausted. There's some Shroom soldiers that are with them. And they said, look, we should dive in Mariv. We couldn't dive in the whole day. Let's dive in Mariv right now. We're a minion. Let's make a minion. Let's dive in Mariv. We need our tefillahs. So they look around. There's only nine people downstairs. So one of the guys says, I'll go upstairs. I'll get the tenth guy. Comes upstairs. The other soldiers, they're already like, they're out. It's already bedtime upstairs. He says, can we get another one for a minion? No response. Rabbi said, please, we need one more for a minion. We have, 
We have nine. We need one more. Let's stop in mind. We need Hashem's protection. So this kid, Eli, the kid who grew up in the illustrious family, B'nai Brav, Kiat Sefer, he says, fine, I'll come out on him. He comes downstairs. He says, just one minute. I have to use the restroom. So it's really, it's a halacha that if a person has to go to the bathroom, you can't say Hashem's name. You can't say brachas. So I don't know. Did he remember this halacha that he had from his childhood? And he went to the bathroom. He's in there one minute, two minutes, two minutes, and he doesn't come out. Four minutes. So they start knocking on the door. Eli, 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 makara. No answer. They start knocking again. Eli, Eli, what's going on? No answer. Finally, him saying, mm, 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 mm. They hear that his mouth is muffled. He's trying to say something. Mm, mm, mm. They break down the door, and they see that this bathroom is not a bathroom. The toilet is the opening to an underground tunnel. There were terrorists that were waiting to come out of that tunnel and kill all the soldiers in the room, in the house. But this guy went into the bathroom. They couldn't shoot him because if they shoot him, they're going to hear the guns, and then the soldiers are going to break in. So they were trying to pull him down into the hole to keep him quiet. But the soldiers broke in. They killed the terrorists. Everybody was safe. And a miracle was made there in Gaza. This kid, Eli, who not even from right now, comes down to make a minion, ends up saving the lives of all the soldiers. So there's a fellow who's here from Eretz Yisrael right now, and he came over to me after Shul, and he told me he had two sons in Gaza, and his son-in-law were in Gaza. Now, Baruch Hashem, they're, they're all on break, they're all out of Gaza right now. He said, they told him, we saw nisim be'eneinu, we saw miracles with our eyes constantly over there, constant miracles we saw over there. That's the only way they could explain that they came out alive. And so this is what it's saying over here. On one hand, on one hand, we go into the Gullahs and we're going to go through difficulties and tragedies and hardships and it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu cleansing Klal Yisrael and removing all the impurities and getting rid of all of our sins and so on and so forth. And the rest of the world will have to see Klal Yisrael is suffering. Why? Because... Because we made mistakes. We're not angelic. We make, we're doing the wrong thing. So HaKadosh Baruch is coming down on us. And, and, and then we say, but there are those people that are mevakshim. They're looking for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's open miracles right now. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, show it to us. And if you look, and you open your eyes, and you see what's going on, and you're hoping, and you're waiting, and you're dreaming, and you're expecting HaKadosh Baruch Hu's salvation, you'll see it right there in front of you. And that's really what the Jew is. He writes over here, Klal Yisrael wanders in Gullis in every different generation, and we have to be aware that we're setting an inspiring example for those that are striving for Hashem's nearness with all their being and who search for demonstrations of His presence in all the events of His history. And that's really what's going on right now. As bad as it looks, but when you hear one story after another, after another, after another, what about all these mice with the people that were saved by the music festival? There's some crazy mice. A, a, a girl got herself a brand new car, a brand, I think a brand new Jeep, like right days before whatever it is, the, the music festival. She had a big Jeep. And somehow, she can't explain it, the license plates fell off while she was driving from her house to the music festival. So when she gets to the music festival, she doesn't have license plates. Now what's big deal? Because there's a very big difference between the license plates of, of an Israeli Jew and the license plates of an Arab Israeli. There are two different license plates. So she comes to the place with no license plates. The thing breaks out. She tells people, come into my car with me. She gets 12 other people into her Jeep, and she starts driving down the road. Now, unbeknownst to her, the exact Jeep that she bought just several days before is the exact Jeep that all of the Hamas terrorists are using to come and come into, and come into the music festival in Israel and kill people. So they see a Jeep, Driving down the road, it looks just like this. There's no license plates, so they don't know that it's Jews. And she just drives straight through and into safety. And she and 12 other people, they're safe. So at this moment in our history, everybody's looking for a spark of hope from HaKadosh Baruch Hu to see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't abandon us while we are here. And therefore, Claudius is praying that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should help us even in these very pressurized times. 
that we should preserve our moral strength and continue its spiritual striving after him. And that's what we need to know, that even when things look dark and bleak and it's not so simple, we have to keep pushing ourselves hard. It's specifically in these times that we have to do more, and we have to try harder, and we have to make ourselves better, and we have to take things on in our lives that we were not ready to do until this time and realize every little step that we take in the direction of of solidifying the relationship that we have with our Kodesh Baruch Hu, it makes it better for Klam Yisrael. It makes it better for ourselves. It makes it better for the Jews that are out there. It makes it better for our Mishpachas. It makes everything better. Because the reason that our Kodesh Baruch Hu puts us through all of this is specifically because He wants us to strengthen the bonds that we have in our relationship with Him. And therefore... We, remember, we remind ourselves that our Kodesh Baruch has scattered us to the far, far, corner, far corners of the world so that, we be, that through the wandering, it will be a reminder of Hashem and the relationship which man should have to Him. Meaning, we become the reminder to the world that when you misbehave and you don't do what our Kodesh Baruch Hu wants, when that happens, you end up being exiled away from our Kodesh Baruch Hu. But then in Gullis, you have to work very, very hard. And you have to put in a lot of effort. And you have to show everybody around you the most valuable, important thing that I could possibly have right now is my relationship with Hashem because I can't trust anybody else. I can't trust the neighbors. You know, there's a story, I think I told it over not so long ago. There's a story, and, and this, we see that it's true from what happened. Many of, a, a big part of why Hamas was so successful in their in their initial uh, attack on, on, on Eretz Israel was because all of the Arab workers that were in these cities, in these villages, janitors, gardeners, security guards, construction workers, they were undercover spies, basically, for Hamas. And they were coming back with all of the details and all of the all, uh, uh, maps and markings of where people are and what goes on over here and here's the shul and here's the place and a lot of people are here at this time of the day. So you can't trust. Many years ago already, I remember after there was the Hanof massacre and there were four Yidin, I think it eventually became five that night, that were killed on that, that fateful morning in, in the shul in Hanof, Sadikim, that were killed. And who was the one that ended up killing them? It was one of the Arab workers from across the street in a market. At that time, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Zeichet Avgivach, said, stop hiring Arabs to work for the Jewish people. Because you can't trust them. You just cannot trust them. So in all of these cities that are on the border, they all had Arabs that were working there and, and, and doing and everything. And they were the ones that ended up producing the maps and the, intelligen- the intelligence for Hamas to know where to go and how to go and so on and so forth. So there is a story that goes back many, many, many years. And that was that there was a, an Arab that worked for a particular family and he was like one of the family. Very friendly, very nice, very kind. They were like a, like a brother to the siblings and everybody loved him. So one night it was getting late and it was too late for him to go back to his, to go over the border or whatever to get home and he told this, the people that he worked for, possible I could stay here tonight. And they said, Mohammed, no problem. You're like one of us. He said, no problem, you stay here tonight. Don't have to schlep back so late tonight. Come stay here. You know what, my son has an extra bed in his room. Just sleep in the room with my son. And the son has no problem at all. The son's very happy. Mohammed is the great friends. So it turns out that in the middle of the night, so the son had to get up to go to the bathroom or something like that. And Muhammad was laying in the bed the whole night, waiting for what he felt was the right moment when the kid would be sleeping. And he pulls out a knife, and he doesn't know that the kid got out to go to the bathroom, and he goes over the bed, and with a knife, <laughs> sticks into the bed, and then he realizes the kid is not there, he runs for his life and runs out of there. You can't trust. You can't trust a single, you can't trust. That's what it's saying over here. And therefore, he's writing like this, that when we are scattered to the four corners, when we are, find ourselves in the gullahs, when we think that HaKadosh Baruch Hu's, his, his, um, his presence is concealed from us, 
So then we have to work and work and work so much harder that even the dark days that are in store for the Jewish people, he would not forsake them and he would always prove to be the Hashem. Yes? You know, I just have to tell a story from my mom. We, in, we lived in Shuba before we escaped. My mom grew up in a home where they had one of the Cuban ladies as a housekeeper. And she lived in the room with my mom. Wow. And this, until my mom was 18 or 19, they got married. This lady of a Basque family came to the house. She was off her purse. With whatever my grandparents ate, she ate. In the homes of the Goyim, they fed them much less beans and rice, whatever. But in the Jewish home, when my parents, when Castro came to power, this lady said, it's about time you people leave. Now, she didn't try to kill them or anything. But to that day, when she heard that, after the way they treated her, her, my mom said, you never, ever trust these people. Right. That's the point. Exactly. Exactly. So I want to share with you the words over here of the Radak because he has a very beautiful insight. And he's going on this Pasuk over here, which is, Al should be that those that hope to Hashem should not be embarrassed through me. Well, how are they going to be embarrassed through you? Ani Mekave Begolus says Dovna Melech, I'm hoping. Even in the Golas, even though it's long and arduous and it's very unknown, I never stop hoping towards you, Hashem. But if you will make my hope be lost, which means you will not redeem me, you will not bring these miracles, you will not take care of me, it's just going to be terrible destruction for Klal Yisrael. So then, Ta'ave Tikvas Kola Mekavim Eilecha. Anyone that hopes towards you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, anyone that's waiting and waiting for your salvation, their hope is going to be lost as well. Ki they will say, Look at these Jews, how they were hoping for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's salvation in their gullahs, in their exile. They ain't my Shia, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu never came and saved them. What an absolute disgrace, Rebbein Nisha'ilam. There are... There are Jews that understand that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is waiting, and that Hashem is going to take care of us and He's going to save us. And we are waiting, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please bring us back home, save our nation, bring us miracles, bring us goodness over here. But if you don't take care of me in the Gullahs, what a disgrace, because people will look at us and they'll say, that's the Jewish people, that's how it works. And there's other Jews that are, you know, everyone's watching right now. All the Jewish people are watching right now. Those that are way far off. What's going to happen to Klai Yisrael? What's going to be? They hear about miracles. Wow, that's, wow, a miracle happened. Wow, that's happening. Wow, that person accepts upon themselves while the, while the RPGs are flying, he's going to keep Shabbos and Hashem saves his life. That's amazing. People are watching. People, even in the, in the more, we'll call it liberal world, are beginning to wake up to what's going on in the world right now. They're beginning to see what's happening. Talking about the Jews that for many, many years they said, oh, we can coexist and everybody has to get along. How many people were killed and murdered in that festival? They were like the biggest promoters of Arab-Israeli relations. Now we realize this, this, it doesn't exist. That doesn't exist. Now, I, gotta, I don't like to get political in this year, but it's not about politics. Okay? This is about Torah. And David Melch is saying, the way the Radak understands is that I'm going to keep hoping to you, Hashem. Because as long as I keep hoping to you, then I'm guaranteed that you're going to bring me salvation. I'm not going to stop. The gullus is long, it's dark, it's difficult. Claudius is going through suffering and pain and everything. We're 2,000 years away from the Beis Hamikdash, and now the world is being rampant with anti-Semitism and the world is against us. But it doesn't stop me from directing all of my energies and my hope towards you. But if I do stop hoping, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then for sure we're finished. The minute that a Jew lets go of the hope, the minute that he gives up on HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then there is no hope for such a person. Yes? You don't think just like the average secular Jew who was maybe in the first month or so inspired, watching, spending money, doing whatever they could, you don't think they kind of lost interest and moved on? I think that even the Shroom Jews, 
that were inspired in the first month mm -hmm. have already lost the momentum and the mm -hmm. steam. And we all remember what it was like on Simchas Torah that we were all crying during mm -hmm. Tehillim. We all remember in those first, those, that first month how we were riveted to what could we do, how could we help, we'll take mitzvahs, we'll dive in for soldiers, we'll, we'll say extra Tehillim, we'll do more. And now it's okay, you know, you turn on the news in the morning, oh, well, we lost another three soldiers last night. Oh, and five got lost. Okay, okay, fine. Well, vacation's coming up in a few weeks. We've got to book the house, the Airbnb. I have to make sure everything's put. Like, we also have lost the intensity that we had in the very beginning. And we're also struggling to hold. That's the nature of the world. The nature of the world is it's hard to keep the momentum going. It's hard to live, you know, again, I would imagine that if you were living in Nazi Germany 80 years ago and the writing was on the wall and the Nazis were coming in and they were looting and they were pillaging and they were killing and they were dragging people into the streets. So the tefillahs in those shuls during that time before the shuls were destroyed and people were taken away, I'm sure that it was like Yom and Yerayim every single day. I'm sure that when they were in the cattle cars and they already knew more or less where they were heading to and the conditions were just horrific what they were in. I'm sure that the tefillahs that were going on in the mouth of every Yiddish mama that was in that, in that car was no less than when they were standing by Ne'ila and davening for another year of life. It was all. But once the things get distanced already from what was the initial impact, we, we all start losing the sensitivity. We all start losing that closeness and that being, being invested in the cause of Klal Yisrael. So if we're feeling it, then yeah, for sure, in the secular, for sure in the secular world, they're feeling it. If we're not davening with the same kavanah when we say to Hillam, certainly out there, it's going to be less. If we're not as amazed by a miracle story the way that we were in the beginning, wow, miracles! Oh, another miracle. She made another miracle. Wow, it's pretty amazing. Okay. Somebody asked me, like, why do you keep telling stories about what goes, what do you mean why do you keep telling stories? It's, we don't have to be mechazek aramuna. We don't have to know that Kodesh Baruch is watching over us. We don't have to realize that this Hashem, with all that is going on, he, he, He's protecting. Uh, uh, there would be so much more casualties and so much more fatalities if Kodesh Baruch would be making these miracles all the time. So we have to be mechazek. And we have to make ourselves stronger. And we have to stick to the things that we took upon ourselves three months ago that we said we're going to do for this and we're going to do this and we're going to try this and we're going to try that and we have to make, in, make it part of our lives that we are living as better Jews that's what David Amalek is saying over here we use the Gullahs to be Megalit to reveal the greatness that we have inside I use the Gullahs it's dark on the other time and then it's a Gilu it's a revelation it reveals the Kaychas that I have inside of myself to do more for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. so says the Radak over here Hashem I'm not going to stop hoping to you. Because through my hope, that itself will be like a schus. It will be like a merit on, on my behalf that you're going to bring a salvation. But the moment that I stop hoping and I stop believing that you're going to bring the salvation, that's it. Game over. I'm finished. So therefore, you, you cannot give up hope. Klal Yisrael cannot give up hope. We have to keep pushing ourselves to the greatest degree that we can because therein lies the secret of our success. The secret is be a, a kaive on Hashem. Hope to Hashem. Be a mavakish. Look for HaKadosh Baruch manifesting Himself here in the world right around us right now. And if, if, if it's not enough, then you have to hope even more. Kave al Hashem. The kave al Hashem. You have, to, you have to do more and more and more to HaKadosh Baruch That's the power of the hope of the Jewish people. So there's so much more to say. That's Hashem. We'll see. We'll see. We'll continue next week. It's a, a long tale. I'll probably skip around more next week. But Lamaisa, it's, it's all very apropos. It's really talking about these times that we find ourselves in. We have, to, we have to recognize that whatever's going on in the negative, it's really to create the positive. Our response is going to dictate where this world is going to go right now, where Klal Yusuf is going to go, where the battles are going to go, so on and so forth. And in Yetz Hashem, if we will just keep being hopeful to Hashem and seeking Hashem and searching Hashem, Hashem will continue to show His light and His miracles and see that we want to be close to Him. HaKadosh Baruch certainly wants to be close to us. 
and that will repair the bonds of damage in our relationship, and that will bring about the ultimate in the relationship of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is the Bi'as Goyal Tzedek Yimhe Thank you, that was amazing. That story with the car, the Jeep? Oh yeah, you didn't hear it yet. Yeah, okay, that was amazing. Yeah, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Yeah, we didn't hear that one. Okay. <laughs> he he probably, no, he's he's too busy you, he's too busy Rabbi recording Rabbi. stories. I'm busy listening to stories. Okay. Well then you record it also as well. All the best. All the best. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. All the best. Good to see you. All the best.